Welcome back. And today we're going to look at the American Revolution, which you'll recall the first shots occurred in the spring of 1775, Concord and Lexington. But for our purposes, we'll really look at 1776 with the Declaration of Independence in July until 1783 with the termination of hostilities, the peace agreement by which Britain recognized the independence of its colonies in North America. I will not get into great detail on the battles. Um, please read them in the textbook, to, about them in the textbook to understand how the war proceeded, but I will focus more on the major developments and of course the outcome. <clears throat> the Revolutionary War became essentially a contest of endurance. Which side the British or the rebels in North America could last the longest? The Americans certainly had the advantage in time. They were in no hurry. They had many, many more men available to serve as soldiers for one or two years and then bring more men in. They did not have to ship soldiers over across the Atlantic, um, which was a great expense. And they had short supply lines. Um, they could easily obtain food and munitions. And early on, George Washington and the other commanders realized that they would win if they just did not have one major battlefield defeat by the British. <clears throat> At the beginning of the war, the British military was much stronger in every sense. In ter classic military terms, they had much better trained soldiers, they had better weapons, and they had a large navy. Many observers have compared it to modern American football, like the Super Bowl champion playing a very poor high school team. Everybody would bet on the Super Bowl champion winning, and this is the way certainly it was viewed in Britain and the rest of Europe. <coughs> the Americans, however, did not steal livestock, food, and, or weapons from the locals. They didn't usually have the money to buy them, so they would give IOU notes saying that we will pay you back after the war. The British, however, simply moved in and stole what they needed, which meant that many Americans who initially had not supported independence became very hostile to the Britons, British and started uh, to actively support the rebels. Clearly, the Americans knew the terrain better, and this was important in the day and age when there weren't very good maps of the area, and obviously there was no GPS um, navigation systems and the Americans set up much better supply lines than the British. <clears throat> the key to the overall conflict was when France eventually recognized the independence of the United States, sent its navy to protect uh, the U.S. coast from the British Navy, and also sent over many skilled military trainers as well as uh, armaments and money. Now, George Washington's strategy from the very beginning was to avoid large direct battles with the British. Um, you can read the details in the book. The first major conflict with the British occurred in New York City when George Washington and his soldiers were quickly defeated. They had to make a quick retreat, and they would have been all captured early the next morning, except the British general made a mistake and didn't move in quickly enough. By coincidence, there was a very heavy fog in the evening, and George Washington commanded his troops to re re retreat across the river into the colony of New Jersey. When the British finally moved in the next morning, they found much to their surprise that the American soldiers had had retreated. <coughs> At this point, uh, Washington and the other commanders decided 
they simply could not win a large confrontation with the, the British soldiers, and so they just wanted to drag out the conflict so the British would tire of the battle and give the United give the colonists what they wanted, which was independence. And as I've indicated here in red, essentially the rebels only had to avoid losing the war. Every year as the war dragged on, it became more expensive and difficult for the British to supply a large, large army and navy in North America. And at the end, the British government and the people were tired of the toll of this war in terms of human loss and particularly the financial cost. And many people point to this as, as somewhat analogous as to what happened with the U.S. Um, support for the United States war in Vietnam, which just went on year after year, and people in the United States finally decided that it was not worth it to continue the struggle. We see in this slide a early recruiting poster um, in the name of George Washington asking for brave, healthy, able-bodied, and well-disposed young men um, to join his forces. And initially, many, many young men thought this was very attractive, even if they personally didn't strongly believe in the need for independence. But particularly, the vast majority of young men were living on isolated farms, sort of seeking adventure, and they would receive $12 just for signing up, which was a tremendous amount at the time, along with a nice uniform. And remember back at this time, the typical farmer might only own two shirts and two pairs of pants, and daily food, and $60 a year paid in gold. So this was quite a bit of money for many young men, and particularly they cherished the thought of leaving their small isolated farm and having some adventure. <clears throat> this illustration is from an English publication at the time showing how the English looked down on the American soldiers. This is entitled The American Rifleman. And as you can see um, <clears throat> on his hat, it says death or liberty. It's a, a man in very poor physical health, can't even stand up straight, wearing a tattered uniform, long unkempt hair. And this was, when the British started, this was their initial impression of the Amer their opponents that this was going to be an easy fight. <clears throat> However, the English had much, the Americans rather, had much better morale. They were fighting actually for something, for independence. And the British soldiers generally, even though better trained and better armed, <clears throat> were not as motivated. And indeed, around one quarter of the British soldiers were mercenaries from, from the Hessian area of what's now Germany. They had a long, proud military tradition there. But a, a mercenary, of course, is a soldier of fortune, someone who's paid by another country to fight for them. So they weren't really fighting for any cause. They were just fighting for money. They weren't dedicated to the principle of keeping the North American colonies in the British Empire. So generally, while they were good soldiers, they were certainly not as motivated. A key element as the war progressed was Benjamin Franklin's skilled diplomacy. Now, Benjamin Franklin was well known in Europe before he went there as a diplomat to get the French support. Benjamin Franklin in the 1750s and 1760s was regarded as one of the most outstanding scientists in the Western world. You may recall his famous experiment, supposedly with a kite, to prove that electricity, that lightning was not a sign of God, but rather an electrical charge. It's not entirely clear whether 
George Washington actually went out in a storm and flew a kite in, into the storm, and then the kite was hit by lightning. But he did write a scientific paper on the nature of electricity and particularly lightning. This made him the best known scientist in Europe at the time. So when Benjamin Franklin went to Paris as the envoy of George Washington, he met with the king. He charmed the king and many of the wealthy French aristocrats. They loved his folksy style. He was getting to be rather elderly at this time, but he dressed in clothing made of deer skins, including a hat. He was very, very charming. And he was, however, not able initially to get the French to provide weapons for soldiers because the French, like most Europeans at the very beginning, thought that uh, George Washington and his group of rebels would have no chance against the British army. And for several years, the British army looked like it was going to win. There weren't decisive battles. But then the Battle of Saratoga in northern New York was a major victory for the American forces. And when George Washington received a letter with news of the victory, his initial reaction, as he told his colleagues, was, we'll now get the French on our side. And indeed, the French king agreed to provide crucial support after the Battle of Bar Saratoga. And the, the French government provided its navy to keep the British navy off of the coast and prevented blockade of the North American ports. It provided a number of soldiers. It provided much needed trainers to go in and help the American forces with uh, military strategy. It also pro provided cash as well as weapons. And indeed, most military historians think that the outcome would have been different if the French had not provided their support, particularly the, the last major battle of the war in Yorktown. The British forces were surrounded and offshore was a large British naval force with many, many reinforcements, but the Fr French Navy moved in between the port of Yorktown and the British forces and prevented the British from landing needed uh, reinforcements. And with that decision, General Cornwallis of the British Army surrendered and surrendered many, many troops. And while that wasn't the end of the war, it was a major military disaster for the British. At this point, the British made a peace offer and sent a delegation to the United States. <clears throat> uh, this is an American cartoon of the British delegation arriving. You'll see that they are portrayed as arriving on their knees, dressed in fine European clothes, and they've laid to their side. We can see in the foreground uh, their swords, and they are basically asking for peace, and they're on their knees to symbolize that they are subservient to the Americans. On the left, we have what at the time was very interesting, a portrayal of the new young country, or what hoped to be a country. Uh, we have an Indian woman with a halo over her head and sort of divine rays coming out. This is to symbolize the native purity of the colonies. And the woman is here, is holding a sort of a spear in her hand showing the strength of the new world. And the woman is sitting on various agricultural products that are exported from the North American colonies to Europe. You see tobacco for France, you see indigo for Spain, and other products. As I indicated early in the course when we were talking about different historical interpretations, 
um, the fact that General Benedict Arnold is generally reviewed, viewed by most Americans as a traitor. In fact, today in politics, occasionally one politician will call another a Benedict Arnold, and that's seen as the worst insult. It's calling someone a traitor. Now, during the American Revolutionary War, <clears throat> Benedict Arnold was one of George Washington's most senior generals. And in fact, Benedict Arnold was responsible in large part for the important victory at the Battle of Saratoga. However, later, largely we think because of the influence of his wife, um, he decided to support the British. And when he was the commander of the important uh, fort of, Bennett, of me, West Point on the Hudson River, just north of New York City, he sent plans to a British spy on how best to attack the fort at night, which of the back gates would have the fewest guards. Benedict Arnold personally draw, drew up a note, gave it to a British spy who put it in his boot. Unfortunately for ben, Benedict Arnold, the British spy was walking down the road when one of the rebel soldiers stopped him, searched him, and found the plans. As soon as Benedict Arnold heard that this had happened, he and his wife immediately left their home and moved on with the British forces. And for the remainder of the war, Benedict Arnold fought for the British side. Um, and then when the British were defeated and left after the peace agreement, Benedict Arnold and his wife moved back to London where he died. However, it's interesting to note in terms of historical interpretation that while Benedict Arnold is the quintessential traitor for most Americans, in Britain, he's viewed as a hero. This is the slide we saw earlier um, in the Mayfair area of London. And this is the plaque on the home where Benedict Arnold died. He was considered and is still considered by the British as an American patriot, not a patriot for the American rebels, but rather a patriot, a British patriot fighting to defend the American colonies from rebels. Well, after the disastrous British military defeat in Yorktown, and some more setbacks for the British, the British finally agreed to a peace settlement, which was signed in Paris in 1783. As you probably noticed, there are a number of treaties of Paris. We saw one after the French and Indian War, and we'll see more, uh, because most international treaties involving European nations were negotiated and signed in the city of Paris. The new the new treaty, the treaty, um, Great Britain recognized the independence of the new United States of America and provided major concessions, um, which greatly increased the size of the United States. <coughs> Here we can see a map at the time of uh, the Treaty of Paris, the new country of the United States is now this large green area that extends from the eastern coast all the way to the Mississippi River up to the current border with Canada and that portion up there in the uh, light brown is actually British territory. To the south of the United States we have Spanish territory of Florida, and to the west, on the west side of the Mississippi River, the Louisiana area at this time was controlled by the Spanish, who of course controlled what is now Mexico, most of Central America, and most of South America, with a notable exception 
of the Portuguese controlling what is now Brazil. Uh, you can see in the Caribbean, um, small islands are controlled by France. Um, and the one notable one, um, the San Dominique, which later became the country of Haiti. And we'll, we'll look a little more at that later. To the north of the United States, again, most of what is now Canada was controlled by Britain. And then if you look the coastal areas of Alaska, that was controlled by Russia. And the area where we have the current states of Washington, Oregon, and the province of British Columbia and Canada was disputed by Russia, Britain, and Spain at this time. So <clears throat> we have the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Seven years later, in 1783, through the Treaty of Paris, Britain formally recognizes the independence of the United States. And now the United States will begin a fairly long involved struggle to structure itself as a viable country and a viable functioning democracy. Important thing to notice at this point, and we'll go into much greater detail in subsequent lectures, is that the Declaration of Independence emphasizes the government's role is to protect the rights of the citizens. And there's great emphasis in the Declaration of Independence on protecting fundamental rights, what were considered fundamental rights um, at that time. Emphasis on the rights of the individual, which meant limiting the powers of government to those powers absolutely needed for a functioning society. Great emphasis was placed on the protection of property rights. This is not only land, but housing and uh, financial assets. The question as to who would vote and the mechanics of voting was left entirely to the states at first. And so suffrage was left to the states and to be provided for in the state constitutions. And as we will see over this, the rest of this course and some in History 1302, Periodically, the federal government would intervene to change the suffrage um, and deprive the states of complete liberty in this regard. There was a significant amount of emphasis in the United States, in the new former colonies in North America, on establishing public elementary schools. This is a significant departure from European practice in that these would be state run on the theory that the populace should have at a minimum an elementary school education in order to to both function economically and to be able to read newspapers and books and become full-fledged citizens. Each of the new states set up a constitution and these were largely designed to limit the power of the new national government. Each state set up a process for elections of the governors, as well as state senates. And most of the states had a Bill of Rights in their constitution. And we'll see much more of this later, but these Bill of Rights were emphasizing the rights of the individual and they were largely a declaration of what the state governments could not do. For instance, the state governments could not impose a state religion, et cetera, et cetera. At, right before the Revolutionary War, eight of the 13 British colonies had established official re religions. Now, however, a really significant change was that all of the state constitutions required freedom of religion and prohibited the establishment by the government of an official re religion. Now, during the war and before the peace treaty was signed in 1783, 
the <coughs> the new states realized they had to have some sort of central government because they had to have someone, for instance, be able to speak with authority for the 13 states um, in negotiations with the French government. And there were certain issues that required a national government. For instance, several of the states had disagreements over their boundary. And if the boundary had been a river, but the rivers sometimes change courses, there, there were also um, economic differences between the states. So in 1781, and again, we'll look at this in a little more detail in the next few lectures, the, the states agreed to set up the Articles of Confederation. This is a predecessor to the United States Constitution. And the Articles of Confederation, by design, established a very weak central government. For instance, the central government had no authority to impose taxes or charge import duties. So there was no source of revenue for the central government. This, of course, was a major failure because the central government needed funding. And the only funding was big was essentially voluntary contributions by the states. Also, the Articles of Confederation required unanimous agreement by every one of the states before a decision could be made, which often meant that no decisions could be made. Moreover, there was no chief executive officer under the Articles of Confederation, so the states would just get together and they would decide who would run the meeting. But it was very much a very weak government. And this had been done on purpose because they had just fought a war with Britain, which had a very strong government. It had a king as well as a parliament. And while the parliament was based on democracy and had significant uh, political influence, the king also had great influence still. Women, really, many of them became somewhat independent during the war. Their husbands, sons or brothers were off fighting or perhaps taken prisoner or unfortunately some were killed. And they would often uh, run the store or run the farm. And also enlightenment thought in, in Europe was, was providing uh, more rationale, intellectual rationale, for women taking an active role. However, at this time and for many decades to come, the essential role of women was viewed as that of Republican motherhood. This meant that the women should be educated sufficiently so they could teach their children, particularly the, the males, the principles of citizenship because the males would vote and they would be running the government. <clears throat> now, at this point with the slaves, all of the Northern states and their state constitutions declared slavery illegal. And so we have no more slavery in the Northern states. In 1790, about 40% of the blacks in the northern states had been free. And as we've discussed previously, the slaves were not vital to the economy of the northern states as they were for the agricultural economy of the southern states. So there was not significant opposition in the north to just abolishing the institution of slavery altogether. During the war, some slaves had thought that if they'd fought with the military, that they fought militarily with the Britain, that would be the best route to freedom because when Britain needed more soldiers in an area, British officers would tell the slaves that they, they would be given freedom after Britain won the war, which of course did not happen. Other slaves <clears throat> in the chaos when there was much fighting in the area would escape their plantations and either go to the back country and live in log cabins or escape to the cities, to a large city, 
and just tell everyone they were a free black. <clears throat> and for the first time, more Southerners started to debate the morality of having the institution of slavery in a republic because the Declaration of Independence is crystal clear when it states all men are created equal. And even though most Southerners agreed with slavery, and we'll see this later in the course, for the first time we have some Southerners beginning to seriously debate the morality of slavery. <clears throat> As I mentioned, some 40% of Northern Blacks were independent, were free in 1790, before a few years later, their state constitutions abolished slavery. About 4% of the Blacks in the Southern colonies were free, and this is about the same proportion as during the colonial period. You can see in this graph, in the United States, there are roughly 60,000 free Blacks at this time about the same number in the North and the South. And of course, there were many, many more slaves in the South, so you had a lower percentage free in the South. And you can see there the breakdown in the South between the Upper South, which would be Virginia and Maryland, and the Lower South, where there were relatively few uh, free Blacks. This is a cartoon from a Boston, or drawing rather, from a Boston, Massachusetts newspaper, which shows the free blacks after the end of slavery, all the blacks were free, dancing at a party. However, the accompanying article is very racist. It talks about how the blacks did not ha know how to dance, they didn't know how to, how to function in polite society. Now, as regards those many British colonists who remained loyal to, to Britain, many, many of them left when the British evacuated their forces and officials after the end of the war. Some went back to Britain itself, others went to Canada, which remained British, and still others went to British um, possessions um, in the Caribbean. <clears throat> By now you should have read the e-reader article on terrorism against loyalists during the Revolutionary War and with you know families often split between loyalists and rebels and you know neighbors often on different sides you did have clearly some excesses with the um, those who wanted independence, viewing the loyalists as traitors, and there were, you know, acts of terrorism. It's not clear how many acts of terrorism there certainly were, and they were well documented. <clears throat> now, as for those Indian tribes that in the north that had supported Britain, many of them simply moved all of their people north across the border into British Canada fearing uh, retaliation. And finally, with peace, now with British and French and, and, and you know, European recognition of the new republic, many Americans had a sense that this was part of God's plan. There was a providential mission that the United States was an exceptional country the United States had fought against the largest army in the world and won, not won in the sense of being able to defeat the British in Britain, but had achieved their goal of independence. And now there was a strong feeling that God was on the side of the new country. And this provided much of the energy and the intellectual underpinning for the United States development over the next 100 or 120 years. Thank you.